Let's move on to the panel discussion, challenges and strategies rep responding to the pandemic. And just wanna put this in context for everybody for a second. And you've seen this slide before coming, uh, or credit to the Hamilton Spectator uh, back in January, uh, just reminding us that if we think COVID is bad, uh, the economic fallout of COVID is going to be worse. Uh, and climate change is still the third wave as we refer to it, uh, that's coming that will drown all of this. I, I, I will make a, a projection and I will be here to speak to it five years from now. Five years from now, COVID-19, we won't remember if it was COVID-19, 17 or 21. Um, and by whatever means we'll have, we'll certainly have adjusted, but we'll have it under control. The economic impact by then we would expect given history, the economy should be bouncing back within five years fairly well. The climate change agenda is not going away. And the challenge to all of us is how do we keep these things in balance to make sure that we're not taking actions around COVID that are going to exacerbate um, the deaths and the destruction and the economic damage that, uh, that are already arising through climate change and are only gonna get worse over that five year and 10 year period of time. So that's our context for doing this. We welcome and hoping everybody's here. Michael, do we have um, do we have Andrew and Rob signed in? Ian, can you hear me? I'm here. Great yeah, stuff. Well. Yes, we can. Yeah, Ian, I'm here too. Hey, everybody, thank you. Excellent. So, um, so welcome. Andrew from, from Sinai Health System, and by way of background, you're aware of the range of facilities that Andrew is responsible for, from the, the, uh, the, the aging Mount Sinai Hospital that's going through endless massive renovation to the sparkly new bridge point that has so much room to improve, to uh, their uh, medical building uh, on Murray, to uh, Ord Street, which is a major research facility. So. Andrew's got his hands full and brings all of those different perspectives to this conversation, um, and especially the big city acute care hospital. So Andrew, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, Rob, we've heard on from a number of times recently, but Rob comes from a, a mental health facility at Ontario Shores. So continuing care, um, similar and quite different challenges and issues there. And Michael Sheeran, thank you so much for joining us from, uh, I guess, the, the healthcare team of the Epidemic Task Force at ASHRAE to bring some knowledge and insights there. And I know we have uh, David Underwood on the line from ASHRAE as well, and Kurt, uh, Kurt Montero, uh, who, again, uh, a friend from so many of these sessions over the past few years and who we regard as a leader in this space from Smith & Anderson. I think Doug Cochran is here, and uh, and so so we have panelists to lead this discussion. But to make clear, this particular panel discussion, everybody on this call is a panelist. So please do pick up on the question, um, uh, send them in. Uh, Amandeep will be again screening them, figuring out where they fit into this conversation, and we will get to as many of them as we can. So thanks at the beginning, and I'll thank everybody again. But this for us is a critical conversation because this is kind of the reality of the pandemic. How is it impacting on healthcare facilities? What are the challenges you're facing? What are the good ideas that have emerged over time? So if I may, I'm gonna start off with, um, with Andrew, if I, I could, uh, uh, Andrew Blair, if I could put you on the kind of open-ended question to begin with, uh, exactly as it's written here, what have been the biggest challenges what kind of changes have you had to make? So, so I guess uh, first I'll say I have an active fire alarm going off in the background. I closed my door. I'm hoping you don't hear too much of that background noise. No, it's good right now. Okay, that's good. Because I can still hear it pretty loud residually behind me. Uh, um, when we talk about COVID, our, I guess our the first challenge was putting everybody at peace that the systems were um, up to 
the level of uh, CSA standard that they should be and that people were going to be safe continuing to operate in them. So what we had to do first was uh, get our air balance. Uh, we, have, we have a partnership with an air balancing company and we took readings and made sure uh, to disclose to all the clinical teams where we currently sat in some of our key operational areas, those being the ICUs, uh, all of our isolation rooms and the ORs proper as, as the, the, the starting point to where we, where we were and where we should go. Um, uh, second point uh, was um, uh, huge challenges to figure out whether we should be prepared for a, the wave two or the, the first surge that we were all predicting would come. And, and, and that was the unconventional spaces. How can we set up additional capacity within the organization? Uh, what does that look like? Do we have the infrastructure? And again, key to everybody uh, during this time was, uh, what is the air quality and how safe will people be in those spaces? Okay, that, that the timelines around that, Andrew, how quickly were you able to get off the marks on this, getting air testing done, identifying the critical areas and, and getting that reassurance out there to people? So, so to get a baseline of, of where we currently were, something, a snapshot that, that depicts the current state, that was done within two weeks, probably uh, early to late February and into the early March when, when this was all really starting to ramp up in the city. And then of course we found minor issues, problems, uh, things that we wanted to correct or, or gaps between the current standard and the vintage of its time and whether we could be nimble enough to make modifications or corrections to get as close to the new standard or the most revised standard as, uh, as we could. And so th there was probably about a four to six week period where we were moving around the building, making modifications, corrections, updating weekly the senior leadership team on where we were and how prepared we could be to number one, run all of our spaces uh, optimally. And then number two, uh, ramp up for a surge if needed. Okay, I wanna come back to additional capacity in, in, in a moment, because <clears throat> uh, we had the, the interesting example from Royal Vic of adapting um, other space to be uh, workable for intensive care and the field hospital, and we're hearing that field hospital turn. Michael Sheeran, picking up on that for a second, around air testing, what, what's your view? Where's, where's ASHRAE been in terms of as all this unfolds in hospitals across the continent, um, where does testing fit in there and, and, and reassurance of people that the world is safe? Uh, <clears throat> for air testing, do you mean uh, test and balance or do you yeah. mean- Yeah, testing and balancing or just testing to make sure everything's running the way it's, that, that you've got the volumes that you thought you had. Uh, without question, I think there's always there there has readily been an encouragement to to make sure that <clears throat> that you 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 have some verification of of at least the air quantities are being provided as your in original design at, at at least performing to the levels of original design. Uh, I think the the bigger changes, which uh, you know. Um, Andrew, maybe, maybe did, they, did, they didn't have to do where they were, but a, a lot of facilities that, that we worked with uh, looked to either uh, increase the exhaust amounts from spaces uh, and in doing so needed to increase the amount of uh, outdoor, outdoor air that was delivered into uh, to counterbalance uh, those air quantities and and so there were uh, a lot more dramatic uh, interim changes, if you will, put in place. Uh, and, and, and with that comes uh, a lot more uh, operational challenge, as you can well imagine. And uh, that is something that we have, you know, I think part of it was precautionary. I think all of the challenge that, that most every hospital facility team that, that we know and we, interact with every day uh, 
uh, face is is how to keep the clinical team uh, as feeling as safe as possible. The perception of safety sometimes requiring uh, to to step to a higher level than maybe even is required by code, required by what we don't know, uh, you know, as much as what we do know. I think the benefit now in the research that uh, has evolved and, and we've become aware of uh, helps kind of step back from, from being as dramatic as, as things had been put in place in March and, and have been able to be adjusted over the course of sub the subsequent months. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, Rob, Rob Simpson, we, we, um, we got this picture from Andrew and we've witnessed it with other big city hospitals that it's, it's been, to say the least, frenetic in terms of the, the level of activity going on in a, in a more out of big town uh, mental health facility. What are the corresponding, again, challenges and actions that you've had to take as all this began? Yeah, I mean, being mental healthy, and uh, I mean, we don't have the same kind of systems that, uh, you know, the typical, uh, you know, hospital hospitals would have around ICUs and isolation rooms, operating rooms. So, so some of the challenges we've had is just with the flexibility of, of what we can and can't do with some of our systems. Um, you know, our HVAC systems aren't much different than, than a typical office building. Um, you know, there's nothing really special about them that you might find in, in some of these other hospitals. So the biggest thing for us is, or was, um, and continues to be just protecting our, our large population of geriatric patients. We have four geriatric wards. Um, so it was identified very quickly uh, what we need to do to, to protect that population. So what we did is we had uh, one unit that was shut down uh, years ago for whatever reason. So we kind of retrofitted that um, to get reactivated in case we ever needed that for for more of our, our general population. Um, and another, another unit we were able to uh, shut down for lack of a better term and kind of retrofit. And we use that as a, as a precautionary uh, unit for, for any geriatric patients that may have had symptoms or, or, or tested positive. So we were able to um, kind of be flexible in that manner so we could move some patients around if we ever had to. Um, I think the big success story for Ontario Shores is we never had to use, we never had to activate either of those units, so which we actually used um, to help out a long-term care facility that was really struggling with some stuff. We took on about 12 uh, patients from them and we had them for a couple months while they had to, to get their, their home uh, fixed up properly, which is, which is a big story for us. That is a nice story. And again, how, how intense was, was the, the anxiety, the need for communication with senior management? What did that whole communication process look like in the early months? Uh, it was, I'm sure it was, was kind of frenetic all over the place in any facility. Um, for us, not, again, I can't speak too much. I wasn't at the table with, with our IMS team, but um, you know, I think that the conversations were around protecting, the, like I said, the geriatric population as much as we could. And then just trying to figure out, um, you know, where to go from there. Uh, not being, a, again, a quote unquote hospital hospital. Um, we were all kind of learning as, as we went, I think. Um, you know, we took some spaces. There's some spaces that are that have a shared HVAC system for, for a clinical space and a non-clinical space. So, you know, I was brought to the table for those conversations about how we can uh, you know, protect our, our non-clinical staff if we have a clinical need. Um, but, you know, so some of those conversations, uh, I, I guess that was the biggest kind of learning curve for, for myself. Okay, let me uh, once again invite Amon Deeps checking the, uh, the kind of questions lines and uh, nothing coming in yet. Again, do take this opportunity. We have another uh, 45 minutes of this conversation work through. Andrew, we've heard from a number of hospitals that they uh, were required to make at least one of their operating rooms convert it to negative pressure. Did that happen at uh, Mount Sinai? So, yes, we, we actually made our, so we've got a, a series of uh, labor and delivery ORs and they had huge concerns up there. And when they built these and they're, they're, they're we're into phase three of our major capital um, development on site. When they've completed phase two, they actually designed the unit with one room, with an anteroom, 
that could be converted to negative pressure. It wasn't at the time, but with the help of our uh, air balancing company, we, we shifted it to negative uh, and then uh, tested and balanced the associated areas uh, in conjunction with our infection prevention and control practitioners. So they now have a negative, it's, it's a corner room, a negative pressure room, negative to the room, positive to the hallway, using the ante room as the pressure zone. So the operating room is still positively pressurized to maintain the sterile field, uh, yes. but the ante room creates the, the negative, if you will, buffer to the corridor system. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. So, so it was designed with that with that infrastructure in place, and that's the only place that I could yeah. peacefully uh, do that. Now, our the new ORs we're building as part of phase three. What, I think there is also an opportunity to to do that going forward. What we did in the main ORs as a mitigator is simply add more filtrations through portable uh, HEPA filtered UV light units, which they historically always did for. Uh, patients that uh, had other, you know, ad hoc illnesses, they would pull in these these HEPA filtered units because, again, if I had changed the pressurization of that one OR, the ripple effects downstream to the central OR core would have uh, been yeah. hard to manage. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask: It's we're not doing any formal polling in in this particular webinar, but the hospitals are on the line, the acute care hospitals that have gone through that process of looking to convert um, individual ORs to negative pressure, and I think in some cases then converted them back again. Could you just kind of send that comment to Am and Deep so we get a sense of how much, and Kurt, may I kind of bring you into the mix here? What, what are the, the challenges and the risks of doing that? I like Michael's comment there of, the, I think Andrew said the same thing, the ripple effects. Once you start messing about with the pressurization in one part, of the OR suite has got a nasty habit of rippling uh, its way through. What, what, what kind of challenges are faced and what, what should hospitals be concerned about when they look to create a positive pressure space, turn it into negative pressure in the, pressure in the operating rooms if they don't have uh, the benefit of Mount Sinai's being designed that way? Kurt, you're uh, muted. There you go. Yeah, so I, I think there is uh, a significant risk of, uh, you know, if you try to run it and make some changes without understanding your current HVAC system, there could be some uh, significant impact. One of the things that um, has happened over the years with the CSA Z317.2 was that the sterile core originally used to be actually negative to the OR. So the OR was positive to all adjacent spaces. The recent uh, changes in the standard in the last decade have switched it to having the sterile core positive to the OR and then the OR is positive to the clean corridor. So you have this cascade effect out. Um, so uh, when you're looking at this situation, I guess what Michael had described, you know, keeping the ante room as a kind of sink, still keeping your ORs positive uh, to all the adjacent spaces, um, you can only do that uh, if you're treating COVID patients, uh, provided you have anti-rooms both into your clean corridor and into st your sterile core. If that's not the case, um, you, you're probably better off uh, maintaining, like keeping your OR negative and then uh, creating a sink in the anti-room that you do have. Um, so one of the things that we've, we've done is when we've provided the advice to some of the hospitals where they didn't have anti-rooms, uh, we, we looked at it and made, we, when the systems were rebalanced, had them make the ORs negative, but making sure that we maintain positive relationships between the sterile core to the OR and the clean corridor to the anteroom, the clean corridor positive to all the adjacent spaces. So going through and doing a verification throughout. So in that case, trying to make, try to make sure uh, that um, we kept the sterile core sterile because you don't want anything from that uh, patient in that uh, OR maybe transmitting things into the sterile core and then it could spread to other OR. So that was uh, one risk that we kind of tried to mitigate. Um, 
And, and there are a couple of other nuances to that about how much pressurization, how negative you want to make spaces, uh, also one, uh, one uh, uh, or to the other. So ideally, if you have two, um, uh, two ante rooms, that would be the best situation uh, in, into both the adjacent spaces. Uh, but if you don't, you kind of have to take a look at it and uh, see how you can mitigate that risk. The other thing we did was we also looked at the air uh, diffusion pattern within the spaces, making sure the sterile area right over the bed, that uh, they were getting get good airflow. And that way, um, I, you know, you, you still create the sterile zone over the patient themselves uh, to prevent any infections or any air that you might draw into the ORs. And Kurt, that differential pressure verification, what did that process look like for a hospital that hasn't yet gone down that path? How do you work your way through the operating suite to make sure you've got, is that done through the building automation system? Is it done with handheld devices? In in modern uh, hospitals with or every OR having its own differential pressure monitor that is done through the BAS system. Otherwise you're uh, usually getting the balancer to work with you to uh, measure uh, what that differential pressure looks like between the adjacent space, uh, between the different spaces. A little bit more onerous task, but uh, in the newer hospitals that uh, you typically depending on the base building system. And and one of the, the nice things about the newer hospitals, they tend to have um, airflow monitoring stations along with balancing damp uh, motorized dampers. So you can make those adjustments to airflows uh, uh, through the BAS without having to go up into ceiling spaces to move dampers around and then verify that with the balancer. So uh, otherwise in, in, the, in the older um, uh, constant volume systems that uh, were predominant maybe 20, 25 years ago, um, you do have to end up going into the ceiling space to adjust uh, balancing dampers, a little bit more challenging, and then measuring differential pressure. I'm wondering if Michael has a different uh, different take on that approach. Which, which Michael? You, uh, sorry, yeah, you, Michael, <laughs> putting a hand up uh, in Orlando. <laughs> I, I would, you know, uh, I would, I would, I would strong, so there's a couple thoughts. Uh, one, certainly uh, in older facilities where maybe you have a substerile uh, room that just adjoins your operating room, which was a very common layout uh, back in the day. Uh, and many people have moved away from using it as a substerile and they use it just as kind of a storage. You can repurpose that space if you don't have room for an ante room to your OR. Uh, uh, I would strongly encourage that you avoid the operating room itself being negative, but continue it being a positively pressurized space. Uh, and this is uh, this is reiterated in all of Ashray's information as well. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure if there's been any interim just um, information out of CSA in regards to this, but but certainly Ashray has advocated the clarity of of everybody understanding and appreciating that the, the best, you know, pathway, and this is also reflected in uh, for 20 years as the guidance has, has uh, been in place for TB patient, you know, uh, uh, you know, typically you're not gonna be operating on a patient that is COVID positive unless there's a dire reason for it, you know, and, and whether that dire region, reason is emergency uh, case uh, activities, or say because they they uh, are a uh, a pregnant mother, and and obviously the time has come. The time has come, uh, uh, you know. So the 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 matter of of uh, you know it being a fairly limited pool of patients that are going to to need to go into that. You could even stand up an ante room as a temporary measure. Uh, and use a HEPA scrubber in in that space to create negative in that space and and uh, accomplish those things, uh, you know, just as a temporary measure, even if you if you need to. In most yeah. cases, I know the facilities they've because maybe you have enough uh, ORs, you can devote one, you know, set one up, set it up, and and know that that's the one. That's typically what's been happening is that there'd be one designated OR for those yeah. types of patients. And that's why I mentioned the, the change in the CSA standard that now differs from, uh, from ASHRAE with respect to the sterile core being uh, positive 
uh, to the ORs. So that's uh, that, that there is a little bit of a differentiation there. And what's I, I thought done. these negative pressure conversions were around COVID patients for inserting ventilators, for example, or is that done in a procedure room? Is are the, are the ORs not used for that? My impression had been that's why those conversions to negative pressure were happening because there was the fear that we'd we'd get a number of people needing to be uh, have ventilators inserted. I guess those are typically being done in isolation rooms and recess rooms in the emergency department um, and in the critical care. Um, I don't know if any of the other uh, hospitals here want to uh, speak up about that, but that's my understanding when speaking to the clinicians in the in the hospitals. That's where it's happening. That's where we've mostly heard of it. Also, because Mount Sinai is such a a large uh, 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 ba baby and high risk baby uh, producing OR suite, the intubation happens right there in the ORs. That's why they were under such duress for me to do something to, to so that when they have those patients that are at risk that have COVID like symptoms, where do we treat them and keep the staff safe while treatment? And so creating ensuring we got the commissioning done and creating that room gave them that space to take the highest risk patients uh, that may have to go into some other modality during that, that, that treatment during that uh, birthing. And I, I think it's really important that you work with your risk management and infection uh, preventionists, uh, because I think it has to be a, a, uh, a, a team decision in regards to what is going to best suit your patient population and the needs of, of, uh, of that and the clinical team without question. Okay, let's pick up on, um, we change gears a bit, and then I want to come back to the human side of this and particularly the communications aspects uh, with, with, our, with our hospital panelists. Uh, and I'd also really like to get some feedback from the, uh, the, the audience and in the absence of volunteers, I may uh, pick on a couple of people just so you've got a heads up. But going on to item two here, Michael, uh, if, if you were kind of giving a lecture right now on the key issues that the hospitals, and again, we've got a mixture of acute care. Uh, we've got some smaller hospitals. We've got some really big ones. We've got a real mixture here. Um, what would be the things that you would flag for them that they may or may not have considered along the way? What are the top of mind HVAC issues that, and some of them are listed there, what are the things they should really be thinking about as this goes forward? And what advice do you have? Can we give you kind of five minutes to give us a little bit of an overview? The, um, I think it, it, is, it is adequately clear, and we briefly spoke about this uh, before our, the, the call started, uh, you know, that, that the virus, uh, as we understand the virus and it, uh, its mechanisms of transmission now, uh, there is less of a, there is significantly less of a concern about it recirculating all the way through an air handler and back uh, into the supply side and, and, and then somehow uh, infecting someone downstream on the supply side. So there's a lot better confidence in the ability to use recirculating air systems uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, a lot of folks went to all air systems, once through air systems, early on as a precautionary measure, and those were not unreasonable. It also was not unreasonable the time of year um, for for many folks uh, when this occurred in March, April, and and May, uh, and and what they had to do then, uh, but that there's probably a, a little greater confidence based on the research to date uh, that says they don't have to do once through systems. Uh, the same goes for, you know, if the, if we go on, on that argument, then the same could be said for, well, if I've put a, a bunch of HEPA filters in my air handler, uh, and now I'm reaching a point where I'm going to have to replace those uh, filters 
do I replace them with uh, another set of HEPA filters? And, and that can be both a very expensive option and also a, a very energy intensive option. So it might be worth looking at that again, based on the area that it serves, the level of concern that you ha we all have, the research that would define that, and then you know consider is a MER 14, which maybe is is the code within ASHRAE and 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 might be similar in in CSA depending upon the area uh, of the it, hospital. It, it is. It's MER 14 as standard yeah. throughout. And uh, uh, and and you know, or is a MER 14 or more of six MER 16 just to as adequate and appropriate to the task. Um, and then that saves you both the cost and the long-term operating costs uh, of those kinds of things. Uh, I think, you know, you talk about energy wheels. I'm interested in hearing the, you know, the, uh, the study information that you're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, ASHRAE is... <sighs> I, I would say our information, the information that's presently on Ashray's website is a, a little bit wishy-washy and, 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 and I think a little bit of that is because there's, there's still open question, but I think, um, you know, if you're dependent upon an energy wheel uh, in order to operate your facility to, to its, its best extent, then uh, I think we're probably at a point where, where we could say that that's okay to do. Um, that's my personal opinion. Don't uh, put Ashray on under the bus for that. Uh, but I, based on everything else we understand to date, um, I would say there's, you know, in regards to humidification, there's there's a lot more push in in conversation around a 40 to 60 RH, which I know blows your mind. But here in Orlando, that's like every day. Uh, if we're lucky, it's only 40 to 60, but, uh, you know, the, the, for at least ICU environments, uh, and, and that, while that has a, a positive impact on the patients in those spaces, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't ignore the fact that it also has a positive impact on the staff and the, the staff reduct the reduction of potential staff to staff transmissions uh, and, and susceptibilities. So it's worth keeping that in mind as well for something when we're dealing with a, a pandemic situation. You know, this is not a normal everyday situation. So it is something, you know, really to keep in mind. In terms of ventilation operation and Rob Simpson picking up on Ontario shores, um, remind us how much scheduling you have of air handling systems there in uh, in different areas, and is ASHRAE recommending any changes to the length of time that systems run when they can be scheduled, administrative spaces, and and, and so on? Because that was a big centerpiece of the conversation around the schools is how long should we be running our fans for in this brave new world? So we have, um, I mean, we run our, our clinical fans 24 seven, obviously. Um, clinical areas we run typically, um, just looking at my wall here, you know, 6 a.m. Till, till 9 p.m., something like that. Um, pretty much just Monday to Friday. You know, the only systems we've really shut down through this, um, we have a big fan for our gymnasium that was that was off limits for a while. That's uh, we can get patients back in there now, so we have that running. Um, and our conference centers, uh, we've shut all those air air, air handlers down all weekend, um, so they're off from you know 9 p.m. Friday until about 6 a.m. Monday morning. Um, so that's what we've done. We haven't done too too much, uh, you know, shutting down of systems through this because we still have a fair amount of, of non-clinical people in some areas. Uh, and they need all, they obviously need the systems on uh, Monday to Friday. But going back to uh, to Andrew's original comments around air testing, uh, how much testing to know what the actual airflows you have and what proportions of outside air are really coming in and so on. How much of that had you done and has that been ramped up at all as this has got underway, Rob? No, we haven't done any any uh, air testing or, or balancing, um, as, as you and, and Amandeep and Michael would know, uh, it's a big need of ours for, for more of a performance, you know, energy savings thing to do a, a complete air balance. 
Um, we were hoping actually to do that that project this year, which got shut down. So we haven't done any any air balancing, air testing, indoor air quality. Um, we haven't done any of those things. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Michael, I wanted to go back to one thing you said about the lack of a concern with, uh, you know, airborne, you know, particulates going through an HVAC system and then being spit out through the supply. Um, I think we all agree that that's, it's very low risk right now, but I'm curious if ASHRAE or, or anybody else on the call, um, what about areas with open air plenums? Um, some of our even clinical spaces were, were once uh, an administrative area that have been retrofitted to a clinical space and may not have, you know, a ducted air, or a return air system. So that's one of the common questions I get is yeah. what risk does that open air plenum where we're right above the ceiling uh, air can be mixed and, and, you know, shot back into the, the occupied space, either clinical or, or, or non-clinical. That's a great question. Uh, and, and we've, we've certainly come uh, ex experienced that question. A lot of uh, both office medical clinic space uh, environments have that. Uh, most of the time, I think what, what we would encourage folks to do is if there are areas where you have COVID suspect folks that you would use some mitigation mitigation strategy in that space or spaces uh, and and then manage the airflow in some fashion uh, that ensures that those spaces are are managed differently uh, and and uh, and and not so much because I I don't think I don't think the concern is is that uh, virus particles per se are going to move from the space into the return plenum and then be diverted into another space, you know, somehow, you know, jump into another space, uh, but that you don't have as, as well a, a matter of, of control of the airflow. And so if you have, you know, you have, uh, you know, spaces that in many cases have very low supply airflow to begin with because they're, you know, exam rooms or whatnot, they're 80 CFM or something small, uh, just simply a door opening and closing can create a plunger effect with some misbalancing of airflow on a very small, small window of, of basis. Uh, so it's, it's going to be better to to mitigate in those areas that have COVID suspect people, and then in the remainder, you know, and then uh, you should be fine in the remainder of the space. Yeah, that's good to hear. That's kind of what I've, I've led people to believe. So that's good to hear. Um, just Ian, back to your original question about, uh, you know, fresh air volumes. It is in our procedure if we ever have to activate uh, either one of those, those temporary units that we've talked, that I already talked about. Um, you know, to, to crank up the fresh air to 100%. The only thing we've done right now is uh, we do have an on-site uh, dental clinic that can lead to some, I think, some aerialization of, of you know, particulates. So we've already, we've been proactive in uh, ramping that fan up to 100% fresh air in, 100% uh, exhaust out, as well as, uh, you know, crank the VAV boxes serving those areas to 100% 24-7. And that's more for them to uh, now that they're open again to maximize the amount of patients they can see. There. Have they have they looked at? Are they also using uh, source uh, exhaust strategies at all? Mm. So uh, the a lot of the a, a number of the facilities that we've seen have used. Uh, if you've ever seen a uh, like a welding bench and it has a HEPA filter with a snorkel on it. We've seen a number of facilities that have used a, a wall-mounted uh, HEPA unit. It's a small box, maybe 100 to 200 CFM, uh, but it has a snorkel attachment and you can put that right up next to the patient, uh, the dental patient, and you could do source capture and that then uh, would uh, minimize the amount, the need for a, a whole space solution, and it and it really addresses more directly where the patient is, where the potential susceptibility uh, could be transmitted between them and a staffer anyway. So we would certainly encourage you to think about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean we do have a welding we we do have a welding shop, so I know exactly what you're what you're talking. About. <laughs> you just exhaust that you would exhaust that into the into the open air plenum or. or 
you, you could you, exhaust it back in the space if you, you have could, a HEPA yeah exactly it's HEPA right. filtered at that point so it's it's good to go okay interesting yeah so i would say that one of the things that you should be looking at in most of your units is just making sure your filter gaskets and your filters are sitting properly in the space because it doesn't matter how good your filter is if you have a bunch of air bypassing your filter that could uh, potentially be an issue and and i will just reiterate what michael said already which is that we've not that all the white papers that have been generated by hvac engineers looking at all the studies that have been out there by researchers there hasn't been any transmission by the HVAC system has been of high draft HVAC system. So stand up air conditioning units in a restaurant, blowing air from one person to the next. But uh, as far as the traditional HVAC systems that we see in most of our healthcare facilities in Canada, there hasn't been any studies that have demonstrated that the healthcare, the, the HVAC systems actually transmitted the virus, not this virus anyways, uh, not COVID-19. Right. And so even like ASHRAE's uh, found the virus inside air handling units, but you know it can't replicate and can't grow there. The concentration can't go up. So it, even if it did get distributed back, um, it's lightly inactivated. But the dilution is quite high, and that's one of the uh, one of the reasons why initially back in the spring, Ashray was talking about increasing outdoor air rates. And now through the summer and coming up into the winter, the thought process has been there's no real value that off that based on the information we've now found out. Uh, filtration is important. Our MER 14 filters in our facility are definitely good enough, provided they're installed properly. Uh, that's where the focus should be. Um, uh, if you've got enthalpy recovery wheels, they're already designed for low cross contamination. They're typically configured so they don't cross contaminate. And so you've got less than 1% of that potential cross contamination taking place. Again, even if there was cross contamination across the uh, enthalpy recovery wheel, it would then further be diluted with all the outdoor air you're bringing in and being distributed to a whole bunch of different spaces. So um, it, really COVID transmission comes down to what's happening within the space itself and patient to, uh, you know, staff and patient to patient transmission and waiting areas, which is the real concern. And we know that's the primary mechanism and the HVAC system isn't the primary mechanism. Um, that's generally being found, uh, you know, with, with exception, like I said, in high draft systems that we tend not to see. And uh, as so that's such a wonderful, Kurt, that's such a wonderful description of all of that without question. Uh, the, the one thing that, that I, I, would, um, I, I would challenge your, your team, if you want to make your facility even better, and I know all, all of you have spent an exhaustive amount of time in the work that you've done to date, uh, look at those, those few areas where uh, there is staff to incoming patient or new, new patient interactions, and you've built, no doubt, Lexan barriers uh, for those, look at where the supply grill is versus where the return grill is or the exhaust grill is in that space. And if it's not from the scenario that you know would be the safest to the dirty, the less clean, then, then think about where those items may need to be changed. Uh, because I know that m most all of you have, have have dealt with all of the big things uh, and and are continuing to refine those big things. So and, and there was one other thing I would say based on just working within the hospitals right now is isolation rooms. Um, have you go back and track and trace what's happening with the isolation room exhausts um, just to make sure that either it's HEPA filtered before it goes out. If it's if if by chance it was designed a long time ago and it happens to be exhausted outside into an exhaust air plenum, understand what's adjacent to that exhaust air plenum, probably put up signage so you don't have facility staff going into that plenum. Um, if, it, if there happens to be rooftop units or areas around that um, it, where it's discharging, probably put some markers down to have people avoid those areas because if you've got, you know, it, it, that'd be something that I would also consider. And then in, your, in, in units that you've got where you've got COVID patients, you know, getting that balancing done to make sure those units are negative uh, adjacent to relative spaces because that's um, the expectation of all your staff is that that's what's happening when they've designated a unit, uh, an inpatient unit to be full of COVID patients. 
Yeah, that last five minutes has been great context for, for this whole thing in terms of where, where are the real issues, where does the real transmission take place, and the concern that ventilation systems get uh, over-attended. Segues nicely into question three, which is, um, Michael, looking across hospitals, some of the older ones, uh, certainly when we talk to schools, unit ventilators, for exactly the reason Kurt was saying, unit ventilators are the main concern where they're just blowing air across the room. They're typically pulling the air in from floor level, which is probably where the nasties are, are kind of hanging out. Um, we still see some induction systems in older hospitals. Um, are there HVAC systems, which the people on the line should be paying particular attention to as being more at risk for COVID transmission? Uh, I, I think just as you describe, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the, those types, uh, even, you know, a lot of older hospitals used uh, small uh, fan coil unit systems and, you know, uh, uh, and, and also in, in a residential type. So I don't know if Rob has them at, at his facility, but other facilities of, 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 uh, of, of that style, of uh, even the senior living, you know, nursing home style facilities are, are frequently have those. I think it's important uh, in areas where you have uh, variable air volume systems, you know, have you reprogrammed those to be constant volume in, in some areas or not? Uh, because if, uh, if they're variable air volume, you need to understand you know where where those are uh, dropping down to a level is is that what you want? Um, the newer facilities, no doubt, are are more efficient because they have the are capturing the energy savings of 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 brand new infrastructure, which is wonderful. But they also may uh, have be taking advantage of, of perhaps newer codes, which in some instances and, and respects also have lower air change rates. Uh, and so some of those rooms may have less dilutive effects happening um, than, in other, than in other facilities where maybe they're older, maybe they have six air changes all the time because they're either constant volume or have been reprogrammed to be constant volume. Um, so there's a lot of those pieces that are worth thinking about. Andrew, let's pick up on item uh, four here, if we may. Um, this whole, Kurt touched on two or three of these things, uh, maintenance practices, inspecting systems that we can have the best HEPA filters, but if the air is bypassing them, um, around maintenance inspection, has, has Sinai Health, in any of your facilities adopted any different practices around uh, around the maintenance staff and their role in keeping things safe? I don't think we've specifically changed the practice uh, because we we believed or we perceived we already had pretty good practices in place. Uh, again, we we've had partnerships with air balancing companies that give us monthly reports and a semi-annual overall uh, ventilation system report, which spawns some of our capital replacement and infrastructure projects. Uh, we, we're in, in between a controls optimization upgrade. So we're, we're deep, doing deep dives into each and every air handling unit in the facility. So we see and know where our struggles and our problems are. Um, and again, all of this was spun because uh, I started in 2018 and wanted to get to know the building. And then the facility manager that was hired at the end of 2018 also needed to get to know the building. And then we 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 added uh, Smith and Anderson the, and the and Kurt Montero and his team uh, last year as a part of our VOR. And so he's now you know in between looking at uh, many of our systems and looking at how do we bring them to as close to the standards as we can in a in a retrofit project. So we we've got a lot of uh, gates in place that that make us really in tune with our systems, our our, our good and our the bad pieces of our systems. And we're starting to put together both short term and long term plans to to continue to mitigate and or replace those systems. And Rob, same question for you. The uh, 
uh, on the maintenance side of things, how are your maintenance staff feeling? Are they doing anything differently to be even safer than, than Ontario Shores historically has been? Uh, nothing around the HVAC systems, Ian, I don't think, off the top of my head. Um, what we and, and what I've kind of hammered home with them is um, in these areas that are that are earmarked for um, either suspected or positive cases that we may get uh, and we have to move a patient in there. I've just uh, asked, asked the plumber and the, the locksmith and, and people like that to go to these units once a week just to make sure the plumbing fixtures work and the lights are on and the doors close properly. Um, just so we can fix those things today instead of, you know, tomorrow when, when there's a patient in there and, it, you know, we got to go through some PPE and, and that brings in a big risk for them. So it's just proactive around things like that uh, in the actual spaces. But around the HVAC system, not really. Um, a little more attention to, to some filter changes and that, but um, nothing, nothing crazy, I don't think. Um, while, I, while I've got you, Rob, the, the, again, the other area we're really interested in is strategies have been adopted by hospitals in communicating to their stakeholders, especially within the hospital. Um, uh, again, looking at the, the experience we have with schools, the bigger concern there is communicating outside the school to parents and so on. But within the hospital, have you, have you come up with cool ways to provide that reassurance, to get the message out there that what we have is safe do the things you're being asked to do in terms of distancing and masks, but we, we've, we've got the, the HVAC thing under control. Is, is there anything? Um, yeah, I mean, nothing directly from me, but I um, mean, our, our IMS team and our, our IPNC team are fantastic. Uh, we're all on the same page. They bring me in for questions when, when they, they need any input. But there's communications, uh, you know, once a week, typically from our CEO that go out, um, you know, thanking everybody for the great job and, you know, trying to keep the morale up, which is which has been awesome. Um, there were weekly touch points, you know, all managers for the first little while. Those have, have kind of tailed off. Uh, you, you know, we do have things under control a little bit, which is good. Um, but there's there's constant communication, whether it be from, like I said, the CEO or, or HR, uh, just about, you know, taking care of yourselves and and you know, following the rules and, and protecting one another. And Andrew, let me ask the same question of you, but but then we'll start if we could around of uh, the panelists and uh, we'll, we'll keep you on the, the line uh, for this, which is just summarizing everything you've heard, what would be your parting thoughts to everybody as we kind of bring this particular session to, uh, uh, to an end. So communication strategies and then more broadly, Andrew, um, what have you heard? What advice would you offer to Alberta hospitals, to Ontario hospitals, acute care, continuing care? You've got a bit of everything um, around there in terms of what you've learned. And if I may, then I, I turn that to you, Kurt, and then to uh, and then to Rob, and ask Michael if he would to bring us home with uh, with his parting thoughts. So, starting with you, Andrew. I would say uh, communication and sharing between the hospitals. Again, if, if you, we, we all, it's a small community and we're, we're all going through the same struggles if the struggle is there. So reaching out to each other and making sure we're, we're on the same page because we, we know the, the, the clinicians will talk and they will know what's happening at the other hospitals. So it is better to be somewhat consistent than to, to, to be pointed out as not as consistent as another hospital or not taking the nth degree that another hospital is taking. Um, and then, and then, just keeping your team in touch with the the, the moving trends of, of the, the clinical practice. Again, during during something like this, uh, the clinical practice will change sometimes daily and weekly. And and ensuring that our, you know the the operations team is fully aware and is nimble enough to to continue to mitigate risk with the change is key to giving everybody peace of mind that we're, we're on top of it and we're informed. Yeah, if, if there's, there's, there's so many words that have kind of characterized the, this whole pandemic experience. So surreal was one of the early ones. Everything was surreal. Nimble is the one we're hearing the most now when we talk to all building sectors, commercial offices, schools, colleges, hospitals, like nimble because it keeps coming at you, doesn't it? There's, uh, there's always something new and uh, the messaging there. Kurt, your closing thoughts. Uh, 
You're uh, muted. Yeah. Um, I would say that um, one thing is about the perception and our understanding, uh, and Andrew alluded to it, but from an HVAC perspective, that has changed over time and understanding what that is and what, what we have to do. I will say that there is some reinforcement of our standards, the CSA standard in Canada, um, actually has held up quite well to, uh, and if we follow the standard, generally speaking, your, your healthcare facilities are gonna be in good shape with MER 14 filters and, and uh, making sure you've got you know, negative uh, pressure rooms working and HEPA filtered exhaust and so on and so forth. So uh, from my perspective, uh, there is some funding made available by the federal government and flowing through the provincial government as well. There are programs out there to take advantage uh, to actually get your facility up to speed and, and get, the, get your spaces balanced, all in the name of making sure that it's, it, it's uh, dis, uh, dealing with COVID well. Right, so there's some funding available to uh, to uh, protect your facilities against COVID, and you really don't have to do that much more in some cases. But really, it's about getting the money to to get your spaces rebalanced. Uh, you can probably benefit from uh, improving some controls as well, um, and and uh, you'll get a better operating facility uh, when you're going through these processes, as well as making sure you've got some peace of mind that it is working um, uh, working as intended. So. Uh, We've used it as an opportunity at a few facilities to look for some funding to to go back and uh, make some changes and make the, the facility operate better than it was in the past. Um, because we know if we just meet the standard, we're in pretty good shape to, to fight with COVID, I guess, or to mitigate any of the risks with COVID. That, that is a really nice new thought that if, you know, that I guess there's a downside and an upside to the fact that so much attention is being paid to ventilation systems the downside is it's being exaggerated and uh, could lead us to take maybe unproductive actions. The upside is this is probably a pretty good time to make the case for making improvements to your air handling systems that we should have made a long time ago. So, uh, so, so I, I, I like that angle. Rob, your closing thoughts. Um, I just like to say, you know, uh, you know, all of my our internal at Ontario shores that the people have done some, some great work here to keep everybody safe, uh, that, you know, the other member hospitals out there, especially the, the critical care hospitals, uh, thanks for the hard work, the engineers, contractors. Um, Ian, I just want to go back to the beginning with that, that slide that you put up with the waves coming. Um, you know, the reason we're, we're all on this call, you know, greening healthcare is, is you know, climate change. Um, and I think, you know, well, the last mix, six months has obviously been dominated by, by COVID-19 and rightfully so, it, it deserves and needs that attention. The next six months, maybe 12 months, uh, is going to be the same. And again, rightfully so. But, um, you know, climate change isn't going anywhere. So I think we need to kind of, you know, keep that in the back of our minds too. And and we do a lot of good work along with, uh, you know, greening healthcare for folks. Um, you know, I think of, of the election going on down south and, and everything, it, it is dominated by, by the pandemic and rightfully so. Um, but they both very differing opinions on, on climate change as well that I think uh, deserves, deserves some more attention. Thanks for closing that uh, that that loop, Rob. It's uh, helpful. And within all this, again, picking up on what Kurt was saying a moment ago, there are win-wins to be had here. This is not uh, these these things are not at odds with each other, and they're not necessarily even to be balanced. And I think, especially air handling systems, testing a number of those themes, those have been needed. We need them for energy efficiency purposes, uh, emissions reduction, and we need them to be sure that we we're providing a safe environment so there are win-wins to be had here michael bring it home oh gosh you're gonna put it all on just like the election you're just gonna put it all on now um, <laughs> we, we always pick on the americans every time i i, I can only tell you that uh, i certainly can't uh tell you what's going to transpire next week i can only tell you that regardless of what transpires next week uh there there's a lot of folks that are equally uh attuned to the long-term consequences of how we operate our facilities and, and the overall consumption levels that, that we can and cannot uh, sustain uh, and the impacts that we create on our environment. So there's, there's, there's a, a significant groundswell of folks that, that see uh, our actions as, as responsible toward uh, getting better results every day. And so I applaud 
you know, what your team is doing and, and certainly what all of your facilities are, are doing and both of what they're doing and also the hopefully the example that they're using as part of uh, their communities. And so, uh, you know, I, I very much wish you, you know, continued uh, success and performance in, in doing that. I, I would, I would, you know, just in regards to maintenance, I'd, I'd want to add one uh, simple item that I've uh, heard from, from some facilities. And, and that is that, uh, you know, they may, uh, they may not do work orders in certain areas until a, a room is vacated um, as opposed, you know, just as a matter of limiting, uh, you know, the potential for, for COVID transmissions. And so, and also have a team, if you will, or, or they've created pods so that they, these pods of, of uh, you know, especially for the larger facilities, you know, they have pods of workers, uh, of facility folks, within, you know, defined within these pods so that they're always working together so that if you lose one pod of folks because of a transmission that affects uh, part one team, it doesn't take out all of your facility uh, team, uh, you know, and, and I, I would only add that, you know, uh, we worked with some of the healthcare facilities in New York and, you know, just as Rob had a facility, they had it set up, it ultimately, um, had a purpose that was beyond their their use, but it was part of a uh, community need of, you know, uh, uh, supporting other facilities. You know, the New York facilities, obviously, they were very early on in what they faced, and, and it was significantly beyond anything that you would ever want to, to face. Um, but one of the things that that really was reflective is, you know, if they had to take over the library and turn it into, you know, COVID support patient space, then that's what they did, you know. And so that nimbleness, um, you know, may have to carry you beyond what your everyday may be, and and that's just part of of what you guys face every day. So we, you know, we feel for those challenges and we hope you never face those level of challenges, but know that we have very, uh, we have a great deal of confidence that, that you'll do what you, you need to do to, to keep folks safe and smart. So um, that's all I've got. It's very helpful, Michael, thank you. So uh, let me, without uh, drawing this out, we've got everything and more that we hope for from this, uh, session these kind of discussions always have a life of their own you've taken us down um paths that we hadn't anticipated and i think you've uh, from our perspective you've picked up on all of the the high spots that hopefully are helpful to everybody on these lines to manage this whole situation um uh, well and better uh, as as this story continues to unfold over time so once again our our profound thanks to to andrew to rob to kurt to Michael for taking the time to share your your expertise, your ex, your your uh, your ideas, your your approaches, your strategies. This has been immensely helpful to us. And once again, all of this has been recorded. It will be available on a go forward basis. So. Uh,